Okay, well, um, I know we don't quite have quorum yet, but uh, I'd like to get started because uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff um, that I want to get through to you today, as always, but uh, I think if we get started any later, we, we definitely won't be finished before 8 o'clock and we'll lose our connections to uh, uh, Cranbrook and it's like uh, Prince George and Victoria today, which is great. So uh, the topic today is HIV. I'm going to talk about a number of things, but when I was researching this topic, this is the thing that really hit me the hardest. HIV is a worldwide problem, and Canada is probably one of the places where it's the least of a problem, but we still have to know about it here, um, because it's not really just a, a nationwide problem, it's a global problem right now. And if you look at these countries, which are all sub-Saharan African countries, this is a look at the expected life ex uh, the, the life expectancy based on the date that you were born. So, if you were born around the time I was born, or if you were born around the time some of the R1s were born, if you're in uh, Zambia or uh, uh, Botswana, for instance, your life expectancy could be up to 65 years old. But if you're born today, you'd be looking at 35 years. So there's a serious global problem that's going on right now and this affects not only uh, the quality of life of these people, it's also uh, affecting their uh, global, uh, or sorry, their uh, GDP and their, their workforce and uh, a lot of these countries are on the brink of being devastated by this disease. So I know that any of us could look up in a book what are the urologic uh, implications of uh, HIV, but that's not really the point of my talk today. I'm going to try and give a total picture of the disease, how it affects people, and then talk some uh, about the uh, urologic manifestations and how to protect yourself as a surgeon. Globally, there's 42 million people estimated infected, and it's probably much higher than this. There's, th this is just documented infections. Uh, there's over 25 million people dead, which makes it amongst the worst plagues of all time, equal with the flu of 1918 and working on the Black Plague of the 1300s, which killed 75 million people. Uh, in 2003, it killed about uh, 3 million people and infected about another 5 million. And if you look at everyone in the world that's reproductive age, about 1.1% of people are HIV positive. This took less than 15 years to become a global pandemic. And it's a, it's a different pandemic than most other ones in the past because it's, it's basically consists of multiple small epidemics. And, uh, in the industrial world, these are mainly populations that have been marginalized. And, uh, but if you look at it worldwide, it's a produ predominantly a heterosexual, uh, disease. Worldwide, it was previously the leading cause of death in uh, reproductive men, uh, reproductive age men in Europe and North America. And since uh, the advent of uh, HAART, -A which is a highly active uh, antiretroviral therapy, death has been declining in these countries that have access to these medications. But if you look at African cities, it still continues to be the leading cause of death. Uh, over you know, 25 to 35 potential years of life lost and the second leading cause of death in women of reproductive age, and this is because of birth trauma is a, a significant cause of mortality. Here's a basic picture worldwide, and this doesn't really tell the story because there's such a disparity between Sub-Saharan Africa, which is 15 to 34 percent, and the rest of the world, but there's not really huge populations here. India and China tell a different story. If we look over time at the epidemic in Africa, you can see as this fills in, there's 82, 87, 92, 97. You can see sub-Saharan Africa becoming a major problem. Botswana, 30 to 40 percent of the entire population HIV positive. Southeast Asia, Oceania, as I said before, there are current epidemics occurring in Cambodia and Papua New Guinea. But you look at this, this is 1 to 1.5 percent of India is uh, infected, and that's a lot of people. Russia and the Ukraine is, is uh, the, probably the worst spot in the world right now to try not to get HIV because it is looking like, like our numbers looked in the early 90s. So two-thirds of HIV-positive people in the world live in Africa, 
mainly in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. The epidemic has been growing steadily. Uh, eight of the nine countries with the most HIV-infected people are in sub-Saharan Africa. But if you look at this, there's estimates of up to 7.6 .6 million people in India with HIV. Um, these statistics really outline global disparities in access to treatment uh, because the places where this disease has got the highest prevalence, uh, they have the least access to medication. And I'll talk about how that's starting to change. 2.2 um, of the 4 million people, or sorry, uh, 3 million people in 2003 that died of HIV uh, were in sub-Saharan Africa and this is compared to 6,000 people in Western Europe. In Canada, if we look at our numbers, we have about 32 million people. Our life expectancy is high, around 80 for men and women. Uh, there's about 60,000 people living with HIV with a prevalence rate of 0.3 in uh, people reproductive age. Uh, there's about 10,000 women uh, and uh, less than 1,000 deaths due to AIDS a year. And this is a little bit hard to interpret, but this is looking at the estimated 58,000 people total in Canada uh, MSM and, and some of the other uh, acronyms in this basically stand for homosexual men or men who have sex with men just to take the bisexual component out of it. Um, that's the majority, 30,000 or about half. There's a population of homosexual men uh, that are IV drug users and then IV drug users representing about a sixth. Uh, Non-endemic uh, heterosexual men basically are people that are from Canada Endemic means they're from a place, uh, immigration to, uh, immigrated to Canada uh, from a place where HIV is more endemic. And they're, they're split up about half and half. Below here you can see the estimated incidence rate in Canada. And uh, it spiked back in the late 80s. But it still continues to sort of creep up. 2005, somewhere between three and 5,000 cases uh, reported. First described in the United States in gay men in 1981, just to go through some of the history here. And uh, 1983, HIV was identified as the cause. 85, there was an antibody test available to the public. Uh, and the real action didn't get started until 1987 in pre preventing this disease when the World Health Organization launched the global program on AIDS. Now, I, I did a bit of research into the history of AIDS and and, and where did this come from in 1981? And a lot of genetic research has taken place with some of the simian immunovirus and uh, immunodeficiency virus in Africa. And they suspect that it actually came from Cameroon in the 1930s when people there hunted monkeys and butchered them on the spot. And there was a lot of blood flying around. And when AIDS was first described in the United States, they think there may have been over a million cases already in Africa. In 1991 to 93, there's about 10 million people infected, estimated at this time. Uh, the first treatment for prevention of vertical transmission was described, and the first decline that was seen in prevalence took place in, in Thailand in IV drug users. Highly active antiretroviral therapy was released in about 1995, and uh, Brazil was the first country to make uh, uh, this therapy possible to the public for free. Uh, at this time, there was about 20 million people in, infected. And UNAIDS, which is now pretty much the heart and soul of monitoring AIDS in the world, was created at that time. 1998 to the present, uh, not a heck of a lot of difference. The incidence has gone up to 40, uh, over 40 million. There's uh, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS is basically AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria is basically a worldwide. Uh, division of the United Nations and uh, this is basically a fund that anyone can contribute to and it's probably the major contributor to getting antiretroviral therapy to Africa. Uh, the 3 by 5 initiative by WHO um, basically decided they're going to try and get uh, highly active antiretroviral therapy to 3 million people by 2005 and Bill and Melinda Gates have totally undermined this program. I'll talk about that later. Uh, the Global Coalition on Women's and AIDS was basically created because the problem now is that w women are increasing like wildfire basically in sub-Saharan Africa and they're now becoming the nidises for transmission and so the real targets are women uh, when looking towards disease prevention. 
three main modes of uh, transmission that we all know, unprotected intercourse being the worldwide number one, contact with blood, which is the most efficient form of uh, transmission, and then vertical transmission, which was also a large problem. Now, uh, this is not the vertical transmission that I'm talking about. <laughs> Let's just take a look at your risk of contracting HIV from different behaviors. Transfusion of contaminated blood carries a near to 100% risk of uh, contracting HIV. Needle sharing for IV drug use, 0.8%, so one in 100 people that share needles with HIV infected people will get this. Receptive anal intercourse is almost as bad, but there's sort of disparities in the numbers from 0.3 to 0.8, which is better than I thought it would actually be. Insertive anal intercourse, even better than that, around 0.1% risk. Occupational needle stick exposure, 0.3% risk, is significant, but um, I'm going to talk about uh, your risk as a surgeon later on. Um, vaginal intercourse, receptive and uh, insertive, as well as oral intercourse, hold fairly low risk, although insertive vaginal intercourse and receptive uh, being the number one cause of worldwide AIDS. Sexually transmitted infections are a very important cofactor um, when looking at your risk of HIV. Uh, they have similar modes of transmission, so a lot of the studies looking at transmission um, are population-based and not necessarily that uh, uh, cause-effect oriented, but non-ulcerative STIs Sorry, ulcerative STIs do carry a per uh, sexual contact increased risk, whereas non-ulcerative are basically an association. I'm going to try and skip over some of the actual nitty-gritty of the HIV virus and some of the new uh, developments in, in what we know about the way that it infects cells, um, but I will focus on how we can target them therapeutically. Uh, the, the structure of the HIV virus is very well understood. Um, there, it has multiple envelopes that protect its, its two single strands of, uh, of RNA. Uh, and there's a lot of enzymes packed in there too, reverse transcriptase, integrase, etc. The cycle is well understood with viral attachment, fusion, uncoding, reverse transcription, integration, expression, packaging, assembly. I'll show you this in a picture. It's a little bit easier to understand. We have an HIV virus here on the left, and uh, this is attaching to CD4 molecules, and there's other molecules too that are being ta targeted as sort of cofactors in its attachment here. Um, there are entry inhibitors also being worked on to try and prevent your ability to get infected, and, and that would increase your ability to clear the virus freely from your, uh, from your body. The uncoding uh, process reveals genomic RNA, which undergoes a process of reverse transcriptase, uh, re reverse transcription, which as we know is the first site of target with AZT and other uh, newer uh, non-nucleoside uh, derivative uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Unintegrated DNA then goes into the nucleus and is integrated into the host chromosome. And this is another target. Uh, viral mRNA is then produced and there's an antagonist to this process and basically the, the cell buds out. And this is the main target of protease inhibitors, although proteases are also used in, in um, revealing the inner capsid of the, of the virus, and, and those are being targeted as well currently. There's three cl clinically distinct phases to HIV infection, uh, and these are important to understand when a patient comes in. You want to try and sort out exactly which phase they're in. Primary infection is a transient systemic, uh, systemic symptomatic illness, which is akin to uh, mononucleosis or any other acute viral illness where you have constitutional symptoms, febrile, um, nauseated often, uh, flushing and uh, fatigue. It happens into up to 90% of patients that get infected around two to four weeks after the infection and it's self-limited, it lasts about two weeks. Um, at this time, you may see high plasma uh, virus levels, over a million copies. Uh, you'll see the CD4 count transiently drop and a CD8 count actually increase. Uh, and when this viral load starts to decline, that's basically sim uh, symbolizes the, uh, the end of this process. Now, standard lab assays, a test for uh, immunoglobulin, especially IgG, will likely be negative at this time because 
uh, your humoral response hasn't had time to kick in. Uh, once the primary HIV infection is over, you move into chronic asymptomatic HIV infection, uh, which basically is the mainstay of, of HIV positive people. It, without taking any medications at all, it's quite a lengthy period. It lasts about 8 to 12 years, on average about 10 um, in most people. And uh, at this time, you usually have very, rel relatively stable HIV levels in the blood. And these HIV levels actually will prognosticate um, uh, the length of the space. So if they're low, usually it'll be longer. If they're high, uh, you, this latent phase will be a little bit shorter. The levels, unfortunately, only stay stable in the blood. Uh, in the lymphatic system, they continue to multiply. Uh, this chronic phase uh, uh, is interesting in the sense that uh, HIV has a, a lot of different ways to avoid being detected. And part of the way that it does this is it maintains itself trapped in a follic follicular dendritic cell network, and it can actually time release of, of viruses according to your immune status. Overt age is, a, is the end stage of uh, HIV infection. Uh, it's defined as CD counts, usually less than 200. Other definitions carry that up to 300. Uh, there are constitutional symptoms at this, night sweats, fever, weight loss. Um, this is the time where you start to see the more opportunistic infections and malignancies as well. Uh, without therapy, usually you get death within two to three years. And if your CD4 counts less than 50, you're at high risk for, for death. If you look at all the patients that present, they can be divided into four different categories. Typical, rapid, um, slow, and non-progressive progressors. Typical progressors constitute about two-thirds of people with HIV. And as I previously stated, their median time or their latent phase is about 10 to 11 years. If you're rapid, usually this latent phase carries a high viral load and, uh, and uh, y y your latent phase will last less than five years. And this is about 10 to 20% of people. Um, uh, and, and in these people, the HIV-specific immune responses can never be detected. Uh, 5 to 15% of people are slow progressors, which is de uh, defined as greater than 15 years. Um, and this is what, this, these are all without antiretroviral therapy. Um, and their viral levels maintain at less than 10,000 usually consistently off therapy. 1% uh, of people are non-progressors. And these are the stories you hear about people being HIV infected and immune. And uh, basically, they, they can go on with very, very low viral levels. And, no one clearly understands the reason that this uh, can happen. Uh, th this is a bit of a complex subject, talking about the early events that lead to the natural history of HIV in different people. The mode of transmission can actually prognosticate your final outcome in the sense that Langerhan cells and dendritic cells, if they're the first cells that are exposed to HIV, they basically can amplify your infection. Uh, and they do this because the dendritic cells will actually pick up HIV virus and present it to an edit, uh, into a T cell, uh, to a naive T cell, and, and that virus that they're presenting is still actually infectious, and the T cells don't know that. And as soon as they hit CD4, the, the virus enters the T cell. Not only do they do that, but they also, um, they also release uh, chemokines that attract naive T cells, and they also migrate from the site of infection to, to lymphatic chains. So in, there's a, a well-documented study of a monkey uh, that gets infected transvaginally into a Langerhan cell, uh, and this cell migrates to uh, the iliac lymph nodes, and basically these cells go on to, to uh, infect all of your lymphoid tissue, and this takes less than two days. So if you're going to go on antiretroviral therapy, you've got to be thinking about doing it fast because it only takes two days basically to expose your entire lymphoid system to, uh, to the virus. It'll take about four to 10 days for uh, PCR to detect viral, viral uh, RNA within your blood. Um, the prospects for eradication of this disease uh, change greatly depending on the way that you're infected. Basically to erase all of the cells that are infected, uh, you need to outlive their half-life. Essentially, so if you are infected with a dendritic cell and it, and it basically amplifies this infection to your entire lymphatic system, uh, you're going to have a, a wealth of 50 
to 100 million T cells that are infected that are latent and just sitting there. And uh, if you look at the virus in the blood, it takes about six hours to clear. Uh, if you have a productive infective cell, it takes about 1.6 days for that cell to burn out. So when you think about, you know, if you get a needle stick or something like that, if you're going to go on antiretroviral therapy, you want to do it soon because if you want your body to basically uh, eradicate all this HIV, it's going to take a long time. And the longer you wait, the more amplified the infection gets. Circumcision status is another hot topic, and it's something that working at the children's hospital, we hear a lot about people asking, should I get my son circumcised? I hear it prevents HIV and whatnot. And I wish I could answer this question for you because I looked at pretty much the, the majority of the literature that's been published on this, and, and there's no clear answer because a lot of these studies are coming out of sub-Saharan Africa or places where, where HIV is epidemic. Um, a lot of this literature comes out of HIV clinics as well. And uh, I, it's just not fair to basically com compare uh, people uh, that are low risk to people that are high risk when it comes to this. But it does look like it's real. Um, there's certainly a, there, there's a couple of uh, prospective trials going on right now in Africa where admittedly the incidence is much higher than here, uh, but they've showed significant uh, results in prevention of HIV with circumcision. Um, so it's something that I think just keep an eye on. There's a bunch of pub uh, studies that are going to be published in the next year on this subject. Um, it sort of makes sense when you look at the abundance of, uh, of cells in the PrEP use. There's follicular, dendritic cells, Langerhans cells, T cells, monocytes, uh, all, this, all the important cells in infection. This is really the only uh, picture that I could try to, to explain it with. If you look at a map of Africa, if you're red or blue, you're more likely to be circumcised. If you're yellow or green, you're less likely. On this side, this is your chance of being HIV positive. If you're yellow or green, you're not likely to be HIV positive. And if you're red, you're more likely to be positive. Now, the only thing I can say about this as well is that there's a lot of different cultures in Africa and probably a lot of different sexual behaviors. And this is a percentage of Muslim people in Africa. If you're green, you're more likely to be Muslim. If you're if you're uh, beige, you're less likely, and it matches almost completely. If you look at the yellow areas, they're almost all green. Somalia, Sudan, Niger, Mali, Mauritania. So these population-based studies are flawed, I think. Um, just a few more things about the way that the virus infects. Free or cell-associated virus is capable of infecting people. The virus concentrations can be variable in people, so therefore, if you reduce the viral levels with uh, antiretroviral therapy, you're more likely to reduce the risk of transmission. If you're on antiretroviral therapy, you are still infectious, and you're actually probably more infectious when it comes to the amount of potential live, uh, years lost that you can inflict on people because of the multi-drug resistance of your HIV. Uh, it's important that you practice safer sex, and in females, it's also important when you look at genital secretions to keep in mind hormonal contraceptives and any sort of pelvic inflammatory disease or chlamydia can lead to uh, increased risk of infection as it thins out the endocervix. Drug-resistant assays are part of the leading edge of HIV technology right now where there's genotypic and phenotypic, that being a, a, a amino acid sequence-based or a minimal inhibitory concentration-based looks at what kind of HIV you're carrying and what kind of drugs it's resistant to. And there's a lot of good clinical tri trials clearly showing benefit to people to do this testing to determine what uh, antiretroviral therapy to put them on. And it's recommended, uh, it's indicated for people that are going on salvage therapy, pregnant women, or someone that presents with an acute uh, HIV infection in an area that's, uh, that w where there's a lot of antiretroviral therapy. So now on to the urologic manifestations. And I, I'm talking kind of faster to get through this, but is there any questions so far or any concepts to be addressed? Are you going to cover sort of the risk with um, transmission, fetal transmission? With vertical transmission or? Yeah, like with, with the maternal, uh, with a pregnant woman, a pregnant mother, Sure. So, 
So I, I think everyone heard the question, but it, it, what is the risk associated with vertical transmission? And that is uh, tr uh, transmission from a pregnant mother to the fetus or to the, to the newborn child. And uh, that risk is very high uh, in untreated people. So it, it ranges, it's estimated uh, between about 85 and 95 percent transmission. Um, and it's not clear in a lot of the population-based studies on whether or not there's transmission from breastfeeding included in that and whether uh, or not it's straightly from birth trauma or from infected blood crossing the placenta. Um, with with uh, the therapy, uh, with uh, antiretroviral therapy around the time of pregnancy, those rates have dropped down to under 10 percent. So it is preventable, um, definitely. Um, moving on to urologic manifestations here, uh, I, there's a lot of sort of weird and wonderful things that you can see in urology. Uh, and I'm going to divide them up into non-malignant and malignant. Uh, of the non-malignant, we're going to talk about a lot of different infections and a couple of other more incidental things. Um, and uh, the malignancies we'll get to in a bit. Talking about sexually transmitted infections, uh, we always have to keep in mind that if people have sexually transmitted infections, they're at risk for HIV. So if anyone comes into the clinic with a gonorrhea, chlamydia, or any ulcer of your um, uh, STI, uh, you need to screen them for HIV. Uh, the, these two populations parallel each other. And uh, ulcerative STIs, as I said before, increase your risk of transmitting and uh, acquiring HIV. So herpes simplex 1 and 2 is the first one I'm going to talk about. Uh, this is possibly the, the most uh, prevalent sexually transmitted disease that becomes problematic in HIV-positive people. Uh, we know herpes simplex is basically uh, uh, painful vesicles that can pop up anywhere in HIV-positive uh, people. There are a lot of secondary bacterial infections, and there's a lot of strange places that this virus will pop up. There's a couple of instances of herpes of the back, behind the ear, <coughs> basically you name it, you can get it there. If you truly want to diagnose this, you can do a viral culture or you can do a biopsy. Treatment of this is similar to in uh, non-HIV infected people. Uh, you want to treat them with acyclovir and uh, you want to consider putting them on daily suppressive therapy if, uh, if the infection was bad enough or is a recurrent infection. And uh, there's also drug-resistant herpes simplex virus out there to keep in mind. If someone has a persistent infection that's not uh, responding to acyclovir, you've got to consider admitting to the hospital and putting them on IV antiretroviral therapy, or sorry, antiviral therapy. Um, HPV is another big one. Basically, um, you can get warts anywhere as the first stage. And this can be on your lips, tongue, um, any oral mucosa, on our genitals, and it can also happen uh, further out on your face. And uh, there's really no change in the in the in the treatment for these people, with the exception that you have to keep in mind that they're at higher risk for malignancy than the general population. Here's a look at some condylomata acuminata, which we know is caused by HPV as well. Uh, there's a bushki lowenstein tumor, and these things can really get out of control in HIV-positive people. And uh, can basically infect uh, all of the perineum and uh, rectal mucosa as well. Syphilis is another one. Primary syphilis tends to present a, as any other with a, with a painless chancre. Uh, syphilis, secondary syphilis uh, can take a number of different uh, uh, presentations. It can be classic, where you have it palm swells and mucous membranes, but you can also get it all over your face, all over your back, your chest, and uh, there's a number of different uh, uh, of skin lesions that can all be related to syphilis, keratoderma, uh, and then widespread gummas as well. Uh, the thing to keep in mind with uh, HIV and syphilis is that, especially secondary syphilis, is that the transition to tertiary syphilis is much easier. And a lot of these patients will present with secondary syphilis and they'll have positive uh, syphilis in their, uh, in their CSF at that time. Treatment is a combination of what we normally do and what we uh, would do for tertiary syphilis, but for secondary syphilis. So if you have primary or secondary, you want to give at least one injection of, of 2.4 million units of PEN-G. 
And uh, you may consider going that to three doses uh, every week, which is what you'd normally give for tertiary or neurosyphilis. Uh, you want to always repeat serologic testing on these people because you may not eradicate it right off the bat. Chancroid is another problem because these lesions are really painful and uh, in HIV positive people it can affect their quality of life. So you want to demonstrate that they've got uh, H2 Cray on, on culture and uh, the patients will typically uh, basically compa- complain of pain and they can have tender adenopathy. And if they have suppurative inguinal adenopathy uh, that's painful, it's almost pathognomonic for chancroid. Uh, and we treat that with Cipro. Molluscum is another problem, HIV. Uh, I, looking through the, the dermatologic atlas, there's pr- some pretty impressive uh, mollusca that you can get. This is related to a uh, human herpes virus 8 or sorry, uh, it pox virus, uh, and it's uh, about 10 to 20 percent of people with AIDS will get mus- molluscum. Uh, we all know the pathological features of it. Uh, therapy doesn't change for, for molluscum. Let's move on to infections. We'll look at renal, uh, prostate, uh, uh, epididymitis and orchitis, and then scrotal and perineal infections. Renal infections, I mean, TB is a major problem in HIV-infected people, and it's something you always have to keep in the back of your mind if you see someone with HIV or if you see someone with TB. Uh, if uh, you have both, basically, you have a, if you have TB and HIV, you have an increased risk of developing clinical tuberculosis as well as an increased risk of developing GUTB and also other extrapulmonary diseases uh, from TB. Uh, and these are quite difficult to diagnose in a lot of patients. Um, other renal infections, CMV, aspergillosis, toxoplasmosis, all the things you see in really immunocompromised people. Um, CMV infection of the kidney is interesting in the sense that it can cause bad ATN and uh, it can also uh, cause the HIVAN or the HIV-associated nephropathy that I'll talk about in a sec. Uh, aspergillosis, toxoplasmosis, you got to keep these in your back of your mind because uh, they do uh, need to be treated with systemic therapy. Abscesses and, uh, can occur in the, in the kidneys and these usually require drainage or surgery. They're highly refractory to antibiotic therapy. Uh, prostatitis, an uh, autopsy shows uh, bacterial prostatitis in 8% of asymptomatic people uh, with HIV uh, that clearly died of AIDS, so I guess you could say they're AIDS. Um, people will complain of obstructive and irritated avoiding symptoms a lot of the time with HIV related prostatitis uh, and they'll often as well have a tender prostate but not always and you can feel some fluctuance if, if it's more advanced um, they can also get superimposed urinary tract infections that may or may not be related um, and to diagnose uh, prostatitis in HIV positive people you got to basically culture them for everything, so aerobes, anaerobes, and fungus, and, and mycobacteria as well. Prostatitis uh, has more of a propensity to lead to a prostatic abscess in HIV-positive people, and fungal prostatitis is also a major problem. About a third of infectious prostatitis uh, in these people will be caused by fungus, and it may require IV um, antifungals, uh, and it may require long-term fluconazole to manage. One of the striking things I found in the, in the urologic literature in HIV is about testicular atrophy. It's one of the most common uh, uh, findings in people with advanced HIV. Uh, and uh, this is thought to be because of endocrine imbalances, febrile episodes, and also just high viral loads and the recurrent infections. Testicular pathology, and this is from an autopsy study, uh, showed that 39% of AIDS patients had some evidence of testicular infection and uh, about 5% of these infections were both toxoplasmosis and CMV, uh, which are things you probably wouldn't think of right off the bat. Uh, If you look at the the testicular pathology uh, from these autopsy patients, there was a lot of findings with latex cell depletion, fibrosis, and uh, degeneration, and that likely is a reflection of having a systemic disease. Epididymitis, also you got to think about these strange bugs and you also have to think about cancer. Testicular tumors are more common in uh, HIV infected people uh, and uh, so the differential diagnosis is always there. These guys are prone to abscesses and may require surgery for epididymitis. Impetigo, uh, another problem. 
perineal impetigo, something you don't normally think about. These are the honey-crusted, honey-colored crust uh, lesions that you normally see on the face of kids. Uh, uh, the treatment doesn't change. It's still caused by Staph aureus, uh, but it can be quite painful. Cellulitis, lymphadenitis, and then neck fash, corneas, obviously a higher incidence in HIV-positive people to keep in the back of your mind. Voiding dysfunction is actually a common complaint, and I don't know if any of the adult urologists here have seen people with HIV come in and complain of uh, some sort of lower urinary tract symptoms, uh, but they think that the majority of this is caused by central and peripheral uh, uh, nervous system effects of both direct HIV infection and also opportunistic um, fungal meningitis and a lot of other very subclinical infections of the brain can lead to peripheral um, uh, nervous complaints. Uh, voiding dysfunction is common, like uh, approximately 30% of people with advanced infection will have some concern as to the way they're voiding. The majority of these involve urinary retention or um, uh, obstructive symptoms. Uh, about a, a third have uh, detrusor hyperflexia that can be documented on urinodynamic testing and outflow obstruction uh, uh, in 18%. Mild dysfunction, basically the therapy doesn't change for that. We want to uh, treat with alpha blockers um, and uh, anticholinergic uh, medications as uh, indicated. Uh, retention, though, is something that you don't necessarily want to operate on. A lot of these patients are advanced uh, HIV and CIC or an indwelling catheter if their uh, mobility is not that great uh, is always a consideration. Uh, HIV-associated nephropathy is not as a disease we see much here. It's basically a predominantly disease in African Americans, a 12 to 1 ratio of black to white. Um, and if you look at the data in the U.S., it's striking actually. It's the third leading cause of people to be on the dialysis unit in the United States for African Americans. And that's after diabetes and hypertension. So you see 47% of the U.S. population um, that's HIV positive is black. And this is compared with 12% of the general population which is black. So uh, as HIV does tend to target certain groups, uh, African Americans have been hit heavily in the United States. And this is one of the main manifestations and one of the leading causes of death from HIV uh, in this population. Uh, IV drug use is the most common uh, risk factor amongst all these people. Um, the clinical incidence uh, is 7%, or sorry, the autopsy incidence is 7%, but uh, Overall, clinically, it represents 3.5% of people that are HIV positive. Um, it's relatively well understood, but it's a classic nephrotic syndrome. You can see all the hypoalbuminemia, hypercholesterolemia, and hypertension from it. Uh, you can have different degrees of it as well. Um, usually, people are on dialysis within one year of uh, diagnosis if they're not on antiretroviral therapy, which is the mainstay of treatment for this and virtually every other manifestation of AIDS. If you can control your viral loads, you can get these diseases under control. ACE inhibitors, ACE receptor blockers, and uh, immunosuppressive therapy is also considered for these patients. Now, another thing you're likely to see in the urologist's office is going to be hematuria. 25% of HIV-positive people will have some degree of microhematuria. Uh, there's been a number of studies done as to the utility of investigating young men with microhematuria, and basically it's very low yield. So unless there's some complicating issue, it's not recommended that these patients undergo a complete evaluation for uh, microhematuria. Older patients, of course, you need to rule out uh, GU disease. You may also see pyuria, bacteria, and proteinuria on these urinalyses. So let's move on to neoplasms. There's some that are sort of urologic specific, and there's some that sort of creep into the urologic field. Uh, the most common two uh, neoplastic uh, diagnoses um, that are non-cutaneous lesions in these populations are Kaposi sarcoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, primary CNS lymphoma and invasive cervical cancer are the other two malignancies that basically are AIDS-defining <coughs> malignancies. Other cancers, Hodgkin's, anal epithelial cancers, skin cancers, myeloma, lung and testes, we'll talk about. KS, so I've had three consults in my residency for penile KS at St. Paul's. And uh, it's the most common vascular neoplasm in HIV-positive people. It's a, a significant cause of mortality and a definite cause of morbidity for these patients. Uh, they get these disseminated skin lesions and they can get focuses of very aggressive disease. Uh, they can also get visceral mets 
from, from chaos. Um, looking at some of these lesions, they're sort of dark and nodular, firm, uh, often purple. They can ulcerate. And uh, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if you have HHV8, your risk of getting uh, uh, KS is over 50% within 10 years. So uh, diagnosis of these lesions, because we do have to deal with them on occasion, uh, uh, is basically a presumptive diagnosis, but you can confirm it with biopsy. Uh, there's no curative therapy for this lesion. Uh, your treatment has to be individualized, but as with all other HIV-related problems, uh, getting viral loads down is the key. You can radiate these lesions, and there's a plethora of case reports of penile KS that's been radiated and turned into an absolute disaster with fistulas and, uh, and erosions. Uh, so although it's part of the recommended uh, regimen of therapies, uh, there have been a lot of disasters with it out there. Cryotherapy, laser therapy, and uh, intracutaneous injections of, uh, of uh, chemotherapy agents is possible. Cytotoxic chemo is not used commonly. It's usually for visceral mets, and pac paclitaxel is one of the new therapies that's being experimented with. Prognosis with KS is quite poor. I mean, if your CD4 counts are over 150, your prognosis uh, median survival is about 35 months. If it's less than 150, you're looking at around a year. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is another big one because this can pre present with masses anywhere, and quite often they're in the testes, prostate, kidney, bladder. There's a lot of different places there. There's reports of seeing non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, these patients are sick. They usually pre present really late uh, with the disease, and uh, the prognosis is poor as well with a median survival of 5 to 10 months. Squamous cell carcinomas and HPV are, is a huge subject with these patients. They can get HPV-related an anogenital neoplasms as well as cervix, vulva, basically anywhere in the genitals, and uh, these can be very highly aggressive tumors. Uh, the exposure categories are very similar uh, with not necessarily the exception of cigarette smoking. Uh, testicular cancer is a bit of a tough one to actually put a finger on, but there's been a lot of ret retrospective reviews on testicular cancer and HIV, and basically the assumption is that there's about a 50 times greater rate of testicular neoplasms, and these are germ cell and non-germ cell. that does not include lymphoma than the general population. These will often present bilaterally, and lymphoma can't be forgotten about because it's always in the differential diagnosis. It's a therapeutic dilemma treating people with advanced uh, testicular cancer and HIV because virtually all accepted treatments with the exception of surveillance have additional immune suppression. Chemotherapy, radiation are very poorly tolerated in HIV positive people. Uh, the standard uh, protocols have to be modified and this decreases their effectiveness. Uh, but the recommendation out there is that they, these patients should undergo standard therapy until it's no longer tolerated. Urolithiasis is another big one. It's a heavily examined topic, and, uh, and protease inhibitors, namely indinivir, are the number one cause, and this is a question of radiolucent uh, stone on CT scan, and indinivir is uh, one of a few different protease inhibitors, but cl the classic protease inhibitor that can cause radiolucent stones on CT. About average, about 10% of people on indinivir will develop some degree of stones, and a lot of them, I think, go underdiagnosed. So um, uh, I, I don't put too much faith in these numbers. And indinivir is not used that commonly anymore. It's been replaced by a lot of other newer uh, uh, protease inhibitors. Um, but just to complete the knowledge of the subject, because it's relatively straightforward, uh, your renal secretion causes supersaturation of indinivir crystals. These are usually doses of over a gram a day. Um, the treatment for this is basically hydration uh, and stopping indinivir. Uh, other indications for intervention are the same for any other stone, solitary kidneys, intractable pain, vomiting, infection. These stones develop at a pH of 7, and they can be dissolved at lower pHs. So if you can get, if you can acidify the urine, you can actually dissolve these stones. Um, usually it's not necessary with them. Um, uh, other protease inhibitors that you may hear about someday, nilfinavir and sequinavir can do the same thing. So there's actually three answers to that question if you want bonus marks. Uh, sulfadiazine therapy for toxo can also cause stones. They're radiopaque, however. 
just to go on now, that, that's the majority of the urologic stuff I'm going to talk about. I'm just going to talk about antiretroviral therapy and preventing exposure in the workplace. Antiretroviral therapy basically is sustained suppression of HIV. And, and the goal ultimately is if you can sustain this long enough, you may be able to eradicate the disease, but it's not possible with the drugs we have today. Um, you want to monitor the treatment. You want to check the HIV RNA levels in the blood to see how effective it's being. You can do these uh, uh, drug resistance assays as well. Uh, previously undetected, uh, untreated patients um, should have, when they go on therapy, undetectable HIV RNA levels within four to six months of treatment or else you're dealing with some other strain of the virus. Uh, and that should coincide with a raise, uh, raise in the CD4 counts. The history of antiretroviral therapy, I'm not going to get into too much, but basically started with AZT, which is a, a antiretroviral, and moved on to two drug reg regimens in the early 90s. Protease inhibitors came in in 1995 and uh, they became the main scene of, of treatment combined with uh, antiretroviral um, reverse transcriptase inhibitors, sorry. Side effects, you can see uh, this malar wasting. Uh, other ones have more specific urologic side effects, peripheral neuropathies, painful ulcers with zelcitabine. Sorry, I'll just go back here for a sec. In Dinavir, we talked about you can get bleeding dyscrasias with ritonavir. Um, and uh, that's something to keep in mind if you have HIV patients that need surgery. Uh, lipodystrophy, as I said, malar wasting. So talking about occupational risks, uh, there, there's not a lot of literature out there because there have not been a lot of documented HIV uh, transmission at the workplace. There's 57 cases reported at the Center for Disease Control, um, and these cases had to be basically previous negative test exposure legitimate exposure and then post serologic evidence and a lot of these pa people that get poked or whatever don't have previous serologic testing which excludes them from, these, from this data. Um, there's been another 138 that are probable that can't be confirmed. There's no documented cases at the CDC of transmission to a surgeon during surgery. Uh, there's six possible cases of transmission from a surgeon however. Um, these, the majority of these uh, exposures were percutaneous exposures uh, that led to contraction of the disease uh, and more rarely mucocutaneous exposures. There's no documented cases of HIV transmission with a solid bore surgical needle. I think that's something that's important for us to all realize when we get stuck is that you're going to be the first one that's been recorded. Um, five risk factors, deep injuries versus superficial. Blood visible on the device is another risk factor, and these all have significant p-values. Devices uh, that have been in a patient's vein or artery, and uh, if the patient died within 60 days, and if you did not take prophylaxis, those all combine risks for this. Um, I, I'm just going to skip over some of the risks. The universal precautions, standard precautions, have been effectively shown to reduce HIV transmission. Latex gloves have been shown to reduce inoculum by 50%. My argument to this is patients will have variations of up to 10,000, uh, a factor of 10,000 in the concentration of HIV in their blood. So 50% may not really change the inoculum that much. Um, what do you do when you get stuck? Bleed freely, administer first aid, clean the wound with soap and water, and then if you can disinfect it, even better. Uh, Post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, the, uh, it has been effectively shown to reduce uh, the risk by 80% if you take it. The problem is that uh, there's a, uh, it's not poorly, it's not well tolerated, um, but there's a three drug regimen recommended. Lesser exposures may be a two drug regimen and uh, it may change the course of which drugs you take depending on what the patient's taking. As I was saying before, there's poor compliance to these medications and they've been shown to cause liver toxicity carcinogenicity, teratogenicity, mutagenicity, all these bad things. And the compliance usually sits around 70% of people that start them, finish them. Um, and uh, there's also been eight documented failures for people that have been on AZT chemoprophylaxis. This is back in the day when that was one of the only medications you could take. So the new medications are thought to be more effective. A couple of things about global health. I know we're out of time, but this is... The incidence of, uh, sorry, this is the number of new infections of HIV in Africa. 
And these are projections of what is the most effective way to reduce them. And the line, I'm having problems with the mouse here, but this line is if we do nothing. This line is if we treat HIV. This line is if we try to prevent HIV. And this line is if we do both. So I think that it's pretty clear what needs to be done. Funding has increased greatly over the last few years. Probably the biggest contribution to AIDS, I think, ever has been Bill Gates, who has contributed over $13 billion, which is more than was contributed in the first 15 years of the disease. Um, and his, his uh, foundation is worth over, well, close to $70 billion, uh, including the $31 billion that Warren Buffett recently donated. They're working on vaccines. They're working on prevention. And, uh, and they contribute 5% of their assets a year. And this is a Bill Gatesism right here, is if you look at people who need treatment and people who get treatment in Africa, this is in 2002 and this is 2005. Blue means you don't get it and you need it. White means you, you need it and you get it. And you can see Botswana, that country that I showed you at the very beginning that's in dire need, is now 50 to 75% of people that need antiretroviral therapy are getting it thanks to Bill Gates. These people are more compliant than we are. Studies have proven this. So if you think that, uh, that it's pointless to treat these people, you're wrong because, uh, because these people will adhere to the medication better than people in the industrial world. That's the end of my talk.